Let's stand as we give the Lord praise and worship this morning. We bring the sacrifice of praise into the house. our study that we're doing at uh, 515 on Sunday evenings if you'd like to join us uh, we did our first week last week but you won't you, it'd be okay to get it in on the second session you won't, you won't have uh, missed too much and so uh, we'd like to welcome you to that also um, our budget and finance committee is going to meet on August the 10th at 7 um, for uh, uh, to begin talking about uh, preparing our budget for the coming year. Uh, also, uh, August the 10th at 12.30, our WMU, uh, oh, that's at 12 o'clock, okay. So that is a correction. If, make sure you uh, make a note of that. It's not 12.30, it's at 12 o'clock uh, on August the 10th. The WMU will be meeting 
and Margaret and Betty will be the, the hostesses. Uh, also, um, August the 10th is a, is a movie night as well, so there's a whole lot going on August the 10th. Uh, then uh, August 21st, uh, 1 p.m. is Callie's birthday party, and everybody's welcome to that. <coughs> August the 22nd, uh, our spiritual birthday party after the service uh, will be going on, uh, and uh, we'll be having our special Don Sunshine uh, event, uh, Make a Difference Seminar that will start during the Sunday school hour. So if you're a Sunday school teacher, uh, let your class know. Let's be preparing them for that because uh, we'll, instead of meeting in our individual Sunday school classes on that day, we'll all meet in here together. And uh, that will go on through that morning. Uh, and uh, the morning service will break for lunch. We'll do our spiritual birthday party and our meal. Uh, and then we'll, co we'll come back for, for the afternoon session till three. Um, and so um, uh, uh, be aware of that. That was a blessing last time. It's been a few years ago. Uh, I'm looking forward to that. Um, I hope you'll, you'll make plans to join us for it. Um, let's see. Uh, Everyday Evangelism Outreach is beginning on September the 13th. Uh, if you'd like to be involved in this but never have, please see me and... Uh, Love to, to talk with you about that. Uh, and let's see, I think we've... You got a flyer about Alyssa's shower, or baby shower, uh, in uh, La Follette. So if you're interested in being a part of that. Uh, today is also the day we take up for Carlos. So don't, uh, uh, don't forget that. Uh, I know some of you, I've, I've been giving uh, each month, and I know many of you have been giving... Um, faithfully to Carlos. There's, a, there's an envelope there in your bulletin you can use uh, to put your, uh, your, your gift to Brother Carlos in, and uh, I'm sure he would greatly appreciate that. Um, he is actually serving, um, ministering in a, in a local church down there for a few months uh, for uh, uh, pastoring there for I guess in the pastor's act, I don't know if he's having surgery or exactly what, but he's there temporarily helping them, uh, as well as doing some of the other stuff he's been doing, preaching on the street and so forth. And, and so uh, the Lord is using what we're giving to make a difference. I, you know, I'm excited. Uh, you know, our, uh, our, our video on Facebook has gone over. We've had people in other countries who have, who have liked or viewed uh, that our videos that we put out um, and Brother Carlos um, has been ministering for some time down there and people have been saved you know there's ministry happening coming from South Clinton Baptist Church in different parts of the world isn't that an amazing thing Amen. and uh, God is at work and I'm so grateful for that so uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer Father thank you for your, your word thank you for uh, the ability to join with your people and uh, to worship you and, and to honor you for all that you've done for us. Thank you, Lord, for giving us uh, ministry, Lord, to reach out to people in various uh, nations around the world and uh, even here in our own city and in this area, God, as we share the gospel. And Lord, uh, help those mission efforts to go forward. Uh, help us reach people, people to be saved and people to be strengthened in Christ, Lord, through the ministries of this church. Thank you for the ministry that you're doing here. And Lord, I pray that today we would meet with you in a very special way, that we'd worship you from the heart, that we'd honor you as the great God that you are. But Lord, also that we would be responsive to your spirit as you convict or, or correct or instruct us, God, today through your word. Help us, uh, for those who don't know Christ, help, help them to repent and put their trust in Jesus for eternal life. And uh, Lord, just minister to individual needs here today. You know how to specifically touch each heart. I pray that you would do so. Lift us up, refresh us in your presence. We pray in Jesus' name. One of the blessings of God that, uh, that I am so thankful for is, uh, is sleep. 
<laughs> God has designed us in such a way that from time to time we need to get some rest. But did you know that, uh, the, and the scriptures tell us this, that God never sleeps or slumbers. <laughs> He's always uh, awake, aware, and I'm glad for that. <laughs> uh, somebody has to be uh, uh, awake and be in charge, and I'm glad that that's God, the good God that we serve. Uh, he's a God of action, and this is one of those action songs, and you know it, hymn number 347, Lord, I lift your name on high, and it talks about the great actions of our God that come from the heart of love. Let's stand as we give the Lord praise. Here we go. Lord, I lift your name on high.
There's no one like our Jesus. We're in John chapter 5, verse 31. John chapter 5 and verse 31. If you've ever served on a jury or been involved in a criminal case, one of the things that you have to do is you have to consider evidence. Evidence is brought forth to try to show the guilt of the one who is the defendant. Uh, then the defense attorney brings forth evidence to try to show that there is reasonable doubt so that this defendant can be released. But ultimately, it is the evidence that speaks. And, and we do that in many spheres of life. We look at evidence. If you read and you, if you read the paper or you read uh, books about different topics, a lot of times there's disagreements and views on different issues such as medicine or uh, just any sphere of life. And you look at the evidence and you come to a conclusion based on that evidence. Well, God has given us evidence as Christians of the truth of the gospel. Um, many religions of the world don't have this historical evidence like we do in Christianity. It sets us apart. It is truly unique. Uh, there is manuscript evidence. There is archaeological evidence. Uh, there is evidence from the, uh, the words of different opponents of Christianity. Uh, really, there's a host of evidence to the truths that are shared to us in the pages of Scripture. And we need to understand what God says about the evidence we need to know about the gospel and who Jesus is. Um, and so this scripture today, if you'll remember, Jesus is being attacked by the religious leaders. Uh, he has healed a man on the Sabbath. He's carrying his mat on the Sabbath. They don't like that. And uh, then Jesus says, I am working, my father's working, um, and, and he, he sets himself up as equal to God, and they don't like that. And so Jesus is making a defense of who he is. And he's saying, look, it's not just what I'm saying. I want you to see all the witnesses that God has brought to the truth of who I am and to the truth of what I'm saying and to the gospel. Uh, and so as Jesus identity is confirmed by these witnesses, it gives great evidence of who they should put their trust in. Who is it? Jesus Christ. And we need to put our trust in Him. Uh, if, you're, if you're a child of God today, you need to know this evidence so you can share it with other people. Uh, if you're not a child of God, you need to hear this evidence so you can make a choice to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. The title of my message is Hearing powerful witnesses. So we need to repent and put our trust in Jesus as we hear these witnesses today. Look with me at verse 31 of John chapter 5. If I testify about myself, my testimony is not true. There is another who testifies about me, and I know that the testimony he gives about me is true. You sent messengers to John, and he testified to the truth. I don't receive human testimony, but I say these things so that you may be saved. John was a burning and shining lamp, and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his life. But I have a greater testimony than John's because of the works the Father has given me to accomplish. These very works I am doing testify about me that the Father has sent me. The Father who sent me has himself testified about me. You have not heard his voice at any time, and you haven't seen his form. You don't have his word residing in you because you do not believe the one he sent. You pour over the scriptures because you think you will have eternal life in them. Yet they testify about me. But you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. I do not accept glory from people, but I know that you have no love for God within you. I have come in my Father's name, and yet you don't accept me. If someone else comes in his own name, you will accept him. How can you believe since you accept glory from one another, but don't seek the glory that comes from the only God? Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. Your accuser is Moses, on whom you have set your hope. 
For if you believe Moses, you would believe me, because he wrote about me. But you don't believe what he wrote. How will you believe my words? So hearing powerful witnesses, what testimony do we hear in this passage? Well, first of all, he has given us the son's testimony. The son's testimony. Now, Jesus in verse 31 says, if I testify about myself, my testimony is not true. But what he means is, not that his testimony is untrue, but that his testimony alone in a Jewish court would not hold water. Uh, it, it has to be two or, or three witnesses uh, according to Jewish law. That is true in the book of Deuteronomy. That is true even in the New Testament. Matthew 18 is an example of that, where you take two or three witnesses along with you. Uh, Paul says in 2 Corinthians, will I have to come with two or three witnesses to establish everything that I'm saying? Uh, and so this is just something that is accepted in uh, biblical truth and among the people of God in Israel. That there, but, but it doesn't deny the fact that Jesus testifies to himself. Now, Jesus' testimony, uh, he's, he's already said, my father's working and I'm working. And they recognize that he was claiming to be equal with God. Jesus has claimed that he will be the judge on judgment day. Uh, Jesus has claimed that he is the one they need to put their trust in. He is the one who can determine their eternal life or eternal death. These are some high claims indeed. Uh, someone once said, uh, either Jesus is a liar because he claimed for himself what is untrue. Uh, or he is a lunatic because he claimed thinking that that's what he was, but he wasn't really that. Or he is telling the truth. And, and, of course, evidence from history shows us that Jesus had a profound impact. He wasn't telling a lie. People saw the works that he did. They observed him speaking to the sea and the sea being calm. I mean, they observed these things. Uh, they, they saw that Jesus, rather than being crazy, was one of the most uh, brilliant, uh, as the, as the uh, opposing soldier said, no one ever spoke like this man before. He, he had a unique character that was unlike anyone else. He stood in a category by himself. And so when Jesus claims these things for himself, it is testimony that is backed up by evidence in his own life. Uh, later on, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. This is the Son's testimony. And so, so we need to hear that testimony. Uh, then you see the Spirit's testimony. If you look in verse, uh, verse uh, 32, he says, There is another who testifies about me, and I know that the testimony he gives about me is true. Now some will take this to mean John, because he talks about John in the next verse, but he changes tenses. He says, This one is testifying about me, but when he talks about John, he says, this one testified about me, past tense. Uh, he's speaking of two different things here. Uh, and, and we know as he's emphasizing the baptism of John uh, and, and the testimony John gave to him, who else gave testimony? Well, the Father gave testimony from heaven. But, but also the Spirit gave testimony as he descended like a dove. And so... Um, uh, the Spirit also is the one who walks on. Jesus is called the Messiah, the Anointed One. Who is it that goes with Jesus in his earthly ministry everywhere he goes? Every time he speaks, he works through him and speaks through him. It is the Holy Spirit. The Spirit gives testimony. Now, this is very significant for me. Because more than anything else, the Spirit's testimony in my heart, I think, is what brought me to Christ. Because I'd heard people talk about Christ. I'd been taken to church as a, as, a, as a young child and everything, and I'd heard many things about Christ. But it was the day that the Holy Spirit pierced my heart with conviction and tenderly drew me to himself. There was that tugging upon my heart. And there was that sense of, of knowing I was lost and I needed Christ that the Holy Spirit produced in me. And I knew something real was going on in me. Now, it took me a while to respond to it, but I knew it was real because he was testifying. 
to me. Isn't it amazing that the Holy Spirit of God still testifies? 2,000 years. What did Jesus say to the disciples? You stay in Jerusalem. You'll receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you should be my witnesses to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. I'm convinced that it is not the wisdom of a preacher or the eloquence of a preacher that saves souls. It is the power of the Holy Spirit who draws men to faith in Christ, who convinces them of the truth, and who works in their hearts to help them repent and trust in Jesus. It's His work from beginning to end. The Holy Spirit gives testimony even to that. He gave testimony in my heart. He was giving testimony in the hearts of those with whom Jesus was speaking that day. That's why he said he testifies. He's doing it right now. You know it. He's dealing with you in your heart. Will you respond? That's the question. The Spirit's testimony is another evidence God has given us of the truth of the gospel and of who Jesus is. So, hearing powerful witnesses, what testimony do we, do we hear? We hear the Son's testimony, the Spirit's testimony. Next, the forerunner's testimony. Look at verse um, 33. You sent messengers to John, and he testified to the truth. I don't receive human testimony, but I say these things so that you may be saved. John was a burning and shining lamp, and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. The forerunner's testimony is John the Baptist, right? Now, John the Baptist is, was a unique uh, example of, of a testimony given because he was testifying before Jesus came on the scene. The people of Israel had gone to him and had heard him and many people had repented of their sins and he had baptized them. Um, and, and then ultimately he points to Jesus, right? So God gave them a prophet who was respected and who was greatly used in their country as someone to testify to them about the truth of who Jesus was. It's amazing how God will put the right people in your life at the right time to talk to you about Jesus. Um, I, I can think of different people in my life that have had, I can still tell you the names of uh, a couple of preachers that made a big difference in my life. Uh, my brother was actually an influence because I was saved at the same time he was. And I had been wrestling with it for a year or so. Uh, he made a choice to do that, and I thought, well, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and pull the trigger. I'm going to... I'm going to do that myself. And uh, so he had an influence on me. And God put people in my life to help me and move me toward faith. And that's what God was doing with John the Baptist. He gave them somebody they respected. Now, I don't know how much the religious leadership respected him, but Jesus makes the point, hey, you sent messengers to him. He reminds them of the fact, you leaders, you remember you sent messengers to him to see about him. This is the one you wanted to hear about and you wanted to hear from. He's the one who, who said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Are you going to listen to him? So he brings up the forerunner's testimony. Um, so you have the Son's testimony, the Spirit's testimony, the forerunner's testimony. Next, the miracle's testimony. Now, this is not a human being, but look at verse 36. I have greater testimony than John's because of the works that the Father has given me to accomplish. These very works I am doing testify about me that the Father has sent me. Um, what Jesus was doing testified about who he was. His mercy testified to the mercy of God. His miracles in healing the blind and healing the lame. Guess what? Some of these religious leaders were spiritually lame. They needed the touch of Jesus Christ upon their lives. He's saying, listen, the works are testifying. If you'll repent and put your trust in me, I can lift you up spiritually. I can give you new life. If you'll trust me. These works were testifying of who he was. And they continued throughout his earthly ministry. Who can turn water to wine? 
Who can raise the dead? Lazarus, come forth. It testified of who he was. And then, of course, the greatest work. Jesus died, and three days later, he walked out of a tomb. <laughs> you can't beat that. Talk about a testimony to who he is. Listen, there's not another human being in all of history who could raise themselves. The Bible says the Father raised him, the Spirit raised him, and Jesus raised him. All three persons of the Trinity were involved. But Jesus overcame death. He conquered it. He defeated it. And he walked out victorious. Reminds me of the uh, Rocky movie, uh, the Rocky Three. I'm a Rocky fan. My wife hates Rocky. But um, Clubber Lang and Rocky are fighting, and, and Rocky's rubbing his mohawk and saying, it ain't so bad. Ain't so bad. And uh, I think that's what Jesus did when he walked out of that tomb. <laughs> Death ain't so bad. <laughs> There's nothing that can overcome the power of our great Savior. He has all power. So his miracles testify to who he is. No one else can claim what Jesus can claim in terms of what he has done. Uh, so we see the Son's testimony, the Spirit's testimony, the Forerunner's testimony, the Miracle's testimony, the Father's testimony. Verse 37. The Father who sent me himself testified about me. You have not heard his voice at any time, and you haven't seen his form. You don't have his word residing in you because you don't believe the one he sent. So Jesus is saying, look, you haven't heard from him because your hearts are unbelieving. And you refuse to believe. What happened at John's baptism? When John the Baptist baptized Jesus, the heavens were open. The Spirit descended like a dove. The Father said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. He testified about it. If you look over in the Gospel of Luke, uh, Simeon and Anna, were in the temple and uh, God had given them a, a message about, about Jesus and uh, you're going to see the Messiah and both of them testify to who Jesus is. Why? Because the Father had revealed it to them. Peter, James, and John are sitting on the mountain with Jesus, the Mount of Transfiguration, and Jesus' clothes are transformed before them and begins to shine. His face begins to shine. Now, I don't believe it was the full dose of his glory because I don't think they could have lived had they seen that. But he gives them just a glimpse. And the Shekinah cloud comes down and Moses and Elijah start talking with Jesus. Boy, that would have been a, a scene. But God says, this is my son. Listen to him. A father's testimony about his own son. The father has given testimony to who Jesus is. Next we see the scripture's testimony. If you look at verse 38. You don't have his word residing in you because you don't believe the one he sent. You pour over the scriptures. Because you think you have eternal life in them. And yet they testify about me. Listen, we need to be careful in reading and studying the Word of God that we don't willfully suppress the truth of God's Word in our hearts and lives. This is what they were doing. Uh, but the Scriptures, he says, you, you are not, uh, they testify about me. These Scriptures testify about me. The testimony of God's Word. Now, what Scriptures are you talking about? Well, this is being written about in John's Gospel. So, uh, it's, it's not the New Testament he's talking about. This is the Old Testament he's talking about. He's saying all of the Old Testament testifies about me. And it is true. From Genesis 3.15, God said, The seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent. Jesus would crush the head of the devil. He did that on Calvary. Stomped on his head and crushed it. Jesus, listen, I'm going to tell you, Jesus is not a wimp. He crushed the devil. I kind of got sidetracked. <laughs> the scriptures, uh, I like that. Uh, 
The seed of Abraham. Jesus says, Abraham, through your seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Jesus is the seed of Abraham. God told David, one of your descendants will sit on my throne and will rule forever. Jesus is the son promised to David. But all of Scripture looks forward to it. The prophets testify about his earthly life, about where he was born, about where he would reside. Uh, they talk about uh, his death in detail before crucifixion was even invented, his resurrection. They talk about the kind of miracles that he would do, the places he would go, the effect that it would have on people. I mean, it's, it, it, there's so much in there. All of it pointed to Jesus. Well, uh, what about uh, the, the Bible characters? The Bible characters, though they don't perfectly represent Jesus, many times are pictures of what Jesus would do. Uh, Joseph, in the, Old, in the Old Testament, he was rejected by his brothers. And then, he, then they met him again, didn't they? And he came back and he ruled over his brothers. He becomes a picture of Christ. When his first coming is rejected, and his second coming comes back to rule and reign as Lord. And every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he's Lord. In, in the story of Elijah and Elisha, uh, where uh, Elijah is the picture of John the Baptist and Elisha is the picture of Christ. I mean, you, it's just throughout Scripture. Everywhere you look. In the life of David. The Psalms. It all points to Jesus. The scriptures testify about me. It's amazing that many people who are very brilliant, some who are experts in language, some who are considered Bible scholars, miss the main point of scripture because they have an unbelieving heart. You can know a lot of things and still miss Jesus if your eyes are not open to hear the truth. Jesus said, these scriptures testify about me. Are you willing to listen to the message of scripture? Next, we see um, the, uh, the testimony, not only of the Son's testimony, the Spirit's testimony, the Forerunner's testimony, the Miracle's testimony, the Father's testimony, the Scripture's testimony. We see the Lawgiver's testimony. If you look over in verse 45, Jesus says, your accuser is Moses, on whom you have set your hope. If you believe Moses, you would believe me, because he wrote about me. Now, you need to understand what Jesus is saying to them here, is that the most important part of your scripture testifies about me. You see... The Jewish people, they have the law, the Torah, that's the first five books of the Bible, written by Moses. Then they had the prophets and they had the writings. But the, the Torah, or the first five books, were considered the most important part of the Hebrew Scripture. Now, we believe that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, it's profitable, and so forth. But for the Jewish people, the Torah was the centerpiece of Scripture, the most important piece. Jesus said, you say you believe in Moses, but Moses wrote about me. So Moses will condemn you. I won't even have to condemn you. Moses condemns you because you've rejected me. What did Moses say about Jesus? Well, he said that a light would come out of Israel, out of, out of uh, the land of Israel that would rule and reign in, in, in the book of Numbers. Uh, I mentioned already the seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent. Uh, the story of Joseph, that's also in the, in the first five books. What about the temple and the tabernacle? What about the tabernacle? The temple was later on in the time of Solomon. But the tabernacle was written about in the Pentateuch, in the, in the Torah of Moses. The tabernacle was a picture of Jesus' redeeming work, a picture of Jesus' himself. What about the sacrificial system that Moses set up? It was a picture of Jesus. 
He was the perfect sacrifice. And the different sacrifices and the things that those different sacrifices accomplished all pointed to Jesus who accomplished every bit of what those sacrifices anticipated. What about the priesthood? The priesthood that's discussed in the Torah. Jesus fulfills the priesthood. He is of the tribe of Judah, which is not the priestly tribe. But his mother had priestly blood in her veins. As Luke tells us in the story of Zechariah and Elizabeth and, and John the Baptist, Zacharias was a priest. Jesus had priestly blood, but, but of course that didn't make him a priest legally in the terms of, of heritage, but it did show that Levi's priesthood would live on in the person of Jesus. Jesus instead is a priest after the order of Melchizedek. He is the eternal priest who is both God and man. He is the king and the priest, Melchizedek, king of righteousness, but also priest. Jesus fulfills both. Written about in the book of Genesis. Jesus fulfills from Genesis to Revelation. It all says with one mighty chorus, trust Jesus Christ. These experts in the law, experts in the Torah, had missed the point of the Torah, which is to point to the one who was to come. In the book of Deuteronomy, Moses tells the Israelites, uh, I know that you're not going to keep this law. And because you're not going to keep this law, God is going to send you into captivity. Isn't that, isn't that encouraging when you've just, you've just been established as a nation and you're already going into captivity because of your sin? I mean, it's amazing. But, but he, says, he says, you'll go into captivity, but God says that he will cause you to return to this land and he will give you a heart to know him. How would he do that? He would bring Jesus. You see, the hope of all the Old Testament, of all the scriptures is Jesus. It all testifies to him. So, hearing these powerful witnesses should bring you to a conclusion. Jesus is who he said he is. We have testimony that continues today. I could give testimony how Jesus has changed my life. Many of you could give testimony how Jesus has changed your life. Listen, I want to tell you something. Our God is not dead. He's alive. Jesus is still changing lives today. He's still making a difference in the lives of people. His word is still being shown to be true. I, it's amazing to me. God is... People are digging stuff out of the dirt all the time that proves that what God said is true. These very testimonies that we're talking about. It, somebody recently, it's been a couple years ago, said, you know, they've been saying, well, there's no such person in history named Pontius Pilate. And uh, then they, they made a discovery and found out that not only was there a Pontius Pilate, but that he was a very significant figure. Imagine that. It's, I mean, it's all over the place. God testified. The soil is testifying to the truth of what God has said. You contrast that to other religions, and you'll see a huge difference. Nothing like the evidence for Christianity exists anywhere. <laughs> we have a unique blessing that God has given us. Why? Because God wants us to be saved. That's, that's the whole point of it all. Verse 34, I don't receive human testimony, but I say these things so that you may be saved. God's given us evidence. Will we believe the evidence? Will we hear the witnesses that testify to who Jesus is? I want to tell you something. There's no hope for eternal life apart from Jesus Christ. There's no other place to look. There's no other answer. And listen, I'm going to tell you, for God's people, there's no other hope than Jesus Christ talking with someone before the service and how can we face the things that we face in this world today without Christ? I don't know how people do it. But we have been given this incredible blessing. Listen, 
If you know Christ, share the message of the gospel with other people. Share what God has said and what God has done through his word. Um, Charlie Campbell is somebody that we've, we've used from time to time in our evangelism training, but he is... He shares a story about going and he had, he, he, before he became a pastor, he worked in a surf shop. And this man came into his surf shop and uh, they began to talk about the Lord Jesus. And the man was Jewish and, and uh, he said, well, did you know that uh, the, the Torah and, and the, uh, the Tanakh, as the Jewish people call the Old Testament, the Tanakh testifies about Jesus, that Jesus is your Messiah. He said, no, I've never heard that before. And he began to go through and he began to show him the prophets, prophecies about Jesus Christ. Well, after a while, um, the man left. He had, he had an appointment. He goes to this high-rise building to have his appointment. He was a businessman. And he walks into this office and the man begins to speak to the man with whom he had the appointment. And the man says, here, I have this material I want to give to you. And it was how the Jewish scriptures point to Christ. And the man was so struck by the fact that God let him speak to two people in such a short time. He knew God was dealing with him. He said, please excuse me for a moment. And he, and he walked into the next room, overcome with emotions. He got down on his knees and he said, Lord Jesus, would you be my Lord? I choose to follow you. And he was saved. I, I, I want you to know, our God has given us evidence. But he also gives us supernatural power. And he speaks into the lives of people as we share the gospel. And he works. And he is such a good, uh, a good orchestrator of, of all the, the events that need to be there to bring somebody to Christ. Uh, we just need to trust him. Let him use us. Share the gospel. But if you're here today and you don't know Jesus, you need to repent and put your trust in Jesus Christ. He's done all that it takes. He lived a perfect life we couldn't live. He died the death we deserved at Calvary's cross so that God's judgment could be satisfied and we could have eternal life. He rose mightily from the dead. And he rules right now at the Father's right hand. And he invites us to come to repent and put our trust in Jesus. Will you do that? Will you say right now, I'm gonna, we're going to bow here in just a moment. Will you say as we pray, Lord Jesus, I choose to surrender to you, to follow you, and I receive you as my Lord, and I ask you to save my soul. Will you say that right now as we pray? Let's pray. Father, thank you for the truth that you've shared with us in this message. God, help us to hear the witnesses, the, the divine witnesses, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the human witnesses, the witness of Scripture and prophecy and all of these things. Father, help us to share the gospel with people who need to hear it. Father, for those here today that don't know Christ, for those watching online that don't know Christ, I pray that today they would say, Lord Jesus, I surrender to you. I choose to follow you. I choose to trust you. I receive you. Please forgive my sin. Give me eternal life. And help me live freely. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to have an invitation time. I'm going to encourage you to respond to the Lord Jesus. If you don't know Christ, if you pray with me, maybe you've just given your heart to Christ, please let me know. Please come and let us... Let us know as a church so we can rejoice with you. Um, also, we want to get some materials to you to help you grow in your walk with Christ and the next steps and so forth. If you're here today and you don't know Christ and you didn't pray with me but you'd like to, please come forward. I'd love to do that with you today. If you're here today and you say, you know, I haven't been sharing Christ. I've been pointing people to Jesus and I need to do that. This altar is open. You come as the Lord leads right now. Thank you.